do appreciate everyone being here and encourage you to be back this evening. And we would remind everyone of the change of ser times of our services. Our second service starting next month will be at 1 p.m. instead of at 6 p.m. as we have been having. So remember that. Also, we'll let you know that if you want to bring a lunch or something like that, uh, the zone room door will be open if you want to go back there and eat. If you want to go out to eat, you're free to do whatever you want to, but uh, in case you want to bring your lunch and just stay over here, uh, that, that will be available as well. Next door, uh, you'd have to talk to the cook about that. <laughs> I think she just said no. <laughs> As we go through our life and journey toward eternity, we say goodbye to one year and we welcome in a new year. And usually we use the phrase at the welcoming of that new year of Happy New Year. So as we enter this new year of 2015, I want us to use this phrase Happy New Year, to learn some lessons that we can apply to our lives for this coming year. I'm going to use that term, Happy New Year, as an acrostic. And if anything, anyone thinks that I'm going to get through, uh, what is that, uh, 12 points in one sermon, the age of miracles has ceased. Some will wonder if I can get through the first five, which I intend to this morning, uh, with the word happy at least. Um, and we'll be doing good then. And then next week, since Brother Tim Kozad will be speaking tonight, uh, we'll finish this up. Uh, but the word happy. We're going to use H to stand for holding fast to your faith. Many Christians, and we all know of many that we could name on our, just uh, off the top of our head, lose faith and fall away from service and worship to God. The Hebrew writer warns us in Hebrews 3 and verse 12 to take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It is possible to depart from God. And I think it's interesting, and I probably don't have the time to do this, but I'm going to take it anyway. Those who advocate the impossibility of apostasy well, there's no need for them to hold on to their faith. They, they don't have any choice in it. But they talk about faith alone saves as well. And once you're saved, you're always saved. But they don't believe you can lose your faith. Yet, here in Hebrews 3 and verse 12, he talks about take heed brethren. And so he's dealing with those who are Christians. And he tells them to take heed lest there be in any of you, you who? You brethren, you Christians. What? An evil heart of unbelief. Thus here are those who were Christians who departed from the living God and they no longer have faith. It is easy to leave the faith and to go into that area of having no faith, an evil heart of unbelief. How? Just depart from God. That's all it takes. 
the possibility is very real, as we all know, of those who have done so. Now, recognizing the possibility being real does not mean the necessity of it taking place. Simply because there's the possibility of apostasy does not mean there's the necessity of apostasy. And so the admonition, hold fast your faith. Because we can lose that faith and fall away. And so we, though within our life, have to make a choice. We choose to remain faithful to God, or we choose to depart from God with an evil heart of unbelief. But we need to, re to make that choice to remain faithful to God. As Joshua took Israel and led Israel into the promised land in the book of Joshua, at the end, he calls representatives of the nation to himself. And he gives them, in chapters 23 and 24, a departing message, if you will. A final message. And in that message, in chapter 24 and verse 15, he says that if it seem evil unto you to serve Jehovah, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. Joshua made a choice. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to serve Jehovah. He made that choice not only for himself, but for his family as well. But there was the choice that was being made in relationship to we are going to remain faithful to God. God has brought us into this land. He's given us this land. And if you read the 23rd and 24th chapters of Joshua, you see that's the emphasis of his message. God has given us everything that he said he was going to give us. By the way, those who deny that God has ful totally fulfilled the land promise today, those who would be premillennialist, they need to go read Joshua tw chapters 23 and 24 because Joshua says God has fulfilled and given us everything. He's given us all the land. He's fulfilled every promise that he has made to us. Thus, I'm going to choose to serve him. I'm going to choose to remain faithful. And he challenges the people to do so as well. It's sad that after the death of Joshua and those who were followers who lived the next generation, the following generation after that, fell away. And they departed from God. And you see, beginning at that point in the book of Judges, a continual falling away from God, a choosing to depart from the living God. And yes, an evil heart of unbelief. And God would send upon them an oppressing nation, whereupon they would finally cry unto God to save them, to deliver them from that oppressor. And God would again send a deliverer, a judge, to bring them out of that bondage, that oppression but they chose not to remain faithful to God. We can, even as Joshua did, but that doesn't mean we will. So we have to make sure that we hold on to that faith and that we, as the Hebrew writer would state in Hebrews 10, verse 22 and 23, to let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he, that, for he is faithful that promised. And a parenthetical statement, he is faithful that promised. God has promised us such great wonders and blessings 
God is faithful that promised. Thus, let us hold fast that profession of faith. Hold to that faith. But then the A could represent a symbol with the saints. <clears throat> Worship services, the time in which we have the opportunity to come before God and worship together, one with another, presents us with an opportunity not simply to worship God, and that's certainly what we are to do while here. We are to give our worship to Him. The idea of worship comes from worth, someone who is of worth, and we giving praises or adoration to that one who is of worth, who is of value. Worship him. We do that through those five avenues of worship, the singing of psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, the study of his word, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine in which we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, our giving, of our means into that treasury to do the work of the church and yes that aspect of praying to the father we have that opportunity to praise God in those psalms in spiritual songs we have that opportunity to give thanks to him in prayer That's assembling with the saints. We emphasize the need to come together as Christians to worship God. And John 23 and 24, or John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus is recorded as saying that the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes, God is seeking true worshipers. We have that opportunity to come before God and give him worship, to worship him, to praise and adore his worthy name, to give thanks to him for all that he has done. We so many times look at the physical blessings, and yes, there are great physical blessings that our God has blessed us with, but there's also the spiritual blessings that we as Christians have. That this world and the people of this world simply do not possess. Oh, how we should give thanks to Him. But there's not the need just that Sunday morning only. As so many times, some individuals mistakenly think, well, I've done all that I need to do. No, if we have that desire, we should have that desire to assemble one with another to worship God. Well, where does, in the Bible does it say that I have to come back on Sunday night or Wednesday night? Well, it doesn't. But if you're asking that type of a question, it shows that you have a love problem because we are to have a love for God first and foremost with our entire being. And if you're having to have a command, to use that terminology, that you must come back to worship God, then you have a heart problem. Our affections are to be set on things above and not on things of the earth. And so it should be a joy and a pleasure to come together one with another as Christians to worship our God, to sing these songs, to pray together, to study God's word one with another. And yes, to partake of the Lord's Supper and give on the first day of the week. it becomes also an encouragement one to another. We encourage each other by assembling with each other and worshiping together. As you are here, you encourage me. My presence should encourage you. But we're also encouraging those in the world. We're setting an example before them. And if they see an example of someone who 
well, he loves God on Sunday morning, but he doesn't love God enough on Sunday night to go back. Well, that shows enough about it, what he really thinks about Christianity, what he really thinks about the church, what he thinks about worshiping God. Or Wednesday night, and they know that the church is assembling together to study God's Word, and we don't have enough love one for another. You've set an example for them. You've not encouraged them to become Christians. You've discouraged them to do so. I've had individuals come to me asking, what can I do to convert my spouse? And I, not being this crass, but uh, really what I've thought every time generally is you first need to be converted yourself. That's not true every case. But so oftentimes, that's the problem. They're not converted. They will come maybe Sunday morning, sometimes Sunday night and Wednesday night, but they're very sporadic in their attendance. They're not getting any encouragement from their spouse, and so it becomes easy to fall away and to not come and attend. And so you need to be converted yourself. And then you can have the proper influence on your spouse that it's going to bring them to God. But it is also that encouragement to other Christians. Now, it's easy to do something if we are all involved in doing it. When I have the feeling that I'm the only one, it becomes difficult. Oh, that was the old Elijah syndrome. Here he won this great victory for the Lord in showing that Baal and his prophets were nothing. And then he runs off and he goes into a great depression, thinking, I'm the only one that there is. There's nobody else. And so he basically is saying, God, just take my life because I'm the only one. I can't do it anymore. And God reminds him or tells him, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. See, he needed the encouragement of knowing that there were others that were involved in the battle. We are in a battle with Satan, with sin, and we need encouragement one from another to live the type of life that God wants us to live. So that I don't have to feel I'm the only one who's doing it. Assembling together, one with another and with the saints, gives us and affords us that opportunity to know there's others with us who will stand with us and will strive with us, fight with us, and that we can win that war. Then the P, that first P, would be to pray earnestly. Jesus was always regularly at least, found in prayer. He saw the need for it within his life. Just go through his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and as it reveals it to, as those books reveal his life to us, and notice how many times he is off, oftentimes by himself, in prayer to the Father. And yet he is that one who is the Son of God. But then also go back and see how he teaches us to pray as well. His disciples, in fact, came to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And so they saw the need for prayer because they saw it within his life. And so he prayed on a regular basis, but he also taught his disciples to pray. And certainly the Bible does encourage us to pray. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 6, 17, pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean, as some have mistakenly taught, that that means we spend 24 hours a day in prayer. 
each and every day, 24 hours, that every day is to be spent in prayer. And yes, some have taught that. And when asked about sleeping, well, sleeping became prayer somehow. But it deals with a life that is characteristic of prayer. That when one looks at you, they think of someone who is a praying person. That's the idea that is being presented. Pray without ceasing. Uh, in Daniel, and with him, uh, as we read the book of Daniel, toward the end of his life, his opposers knew that there was no way that they could bring any accusation against him and it be upheld. So what did they do? Oh, well, we got an idea. We'll go to Darius and ask and get him work on his pride a little bit and say, you know, you make it a law of the Medes and Pers Persians, that's a law that cannot be changed and altered, that if anyone prays to any god other than you, King Darius, that they be thrown in the lion's den. So Darius makes that law. Why did they go to Darius and ask him to do so? Because they knew that Daniel was going out and he would go and pray. He did. He was cast in the lion's den, but God stopped the mouths of the lion. He was one who prayed without ceasing. In Colossians 4 and verse 2, it says to continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. Part of that prayer life is giving thanks to God. We need to be a thankful people. You know, we talk about giving thanks when Thanksgiving comes around a great deal, and rightly so, but it should not be limited to that time. We need to be known as a thankful people a people who expresses their thanks to others, but more especially, their thanks unto God. God is the creator of this universe. And just stop sometime and look at the beauties of this world. The physical beauty, look at the stars. Not only does it show the handiwork of God, we see the beauty that's displayed there. Why did God create all those stars for us? Well, it's for us, that's why. He presented to us a beautiful place to live. And he places within this world the beauties of this world. Why? For us for our enjoyment, for our pleasure. We need to be a thankful people. He created this world, but he's also the sustainer of it. We wouldn't continue to exist without him. And so he sustains us. We need to be thankful to him. We need to be thankful for the air that we breathe, the water that we're able to drink, the food that we're able to eat. And while some say, well, I did it all myself. I went out and I hold the ground and I planted the seed and I made sure that everything, all those weeds were kept out and I did all of this work. You wouldn't be able to do any of the work without God. We need to be a thankful people. But prayer, part of that praying is being a thankful people. And we need to realize that prayer certainly incur, uh, is, accomplishes a great deal. James would state in James 5 and verse 16 that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It doesn't just avail, but he goes beyond that. It avails a great deal. Because we have the ear of the creator of the universe. His ears are open to our prayers. 
Now that person in the world, that one who's not a Christian, he doesn't have that. Doesn't have that opportunity. But in 1 John, the third chapter, and verse 22, John would say that whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then John comes along and tells us that whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. A wonderful promise. And if that wasn't enough, he would again reiterate this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. That this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. What a wonderful opportunity that we can go before the throne of God. A Hebrews writer expresses it, that we can come boldly before his throne of grace to obtain mercy in times of need. we can go to that throne of grace knowing that he hears us and that those things that God knows that are for our best, our good, he will do for us. Truly a, a wonderful opportunity that we have and thus we should be individuals who are, being, are, who are characteristic of prayer. Pray without ceasing. Be constant, instant in prayer. But then the next P would stand for preparing your heart. First, preparing your heart for great blessings from God. Solomon would write in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, to honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now then, that's not being spoken of from just very simply a physical standpoint. Solomon is using the physical to show spiritual lessons. That God will bless us spiritually as we are obedient in him. As we honor him, as we do his will, as we give to him as we should, in all of the ways that we should, giving of our time, yes, giving of our abilities, giving of our interests, giving of our money, giving all of our lives to him. As we give ourselves unto him, God will bless us. The fulfillment of that is seen over in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That here is all of these spiritual blessings that God has. He's ready to bestow them upon that individual who is in Christ. That individual who honors him. And the only way to honor Jehovah is to be obedient to his will. To live for him. To truly love God first and foremost within our life. Love the church as Jesus talks about in uh, Matthew 6 and verse 33. Those are the things that we are to seek first within our life. Honor the Lord. And then what is it? Here's all of these blessings that he will bestow upon his children. One of them is the very fact that we shall be called the children of God. What a wonderful honor and privilege that we have to be called God's children. That all of those old sins and those old mistakes, they're passed away. Old things are become are passed away. All things are become new. St. Corinthians 5 and verse 17. You talk about the land of beginning again. Well, there it is. 
we can truly begin again because that old life is dead. It's passed away. It no longer exists. And now then, we have these blessings of God. We have no condemnation, Romans 8 and verse 1. We have salvation and grace in Christ, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 and verse 10. We have access to the Father through Christ, Ephesians 2 and verse uh, 16. He is that way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Him, John 14 and verse 6. All of the spiritual blessings bestowed upon His children. But then we need to prepare our hearts for those blessings from God, but also we need to be preparing our hearts to teach others. In 1 Peter, the, first, the third chapter and verse 15, Peter would say, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts always, uh, and be ready always to give an answer to every man uh, that asketh, a, a re, asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you both with meekness and fear. Be ready to give an answer. Now, here's something that that person in the world, one of these spiritual, these great blessings from God, is a blessing of hope. In fact, Paul would write in Romans the 8th chapter, By hope are ye saved. But those outside of Christ, he expresses in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, are those without hope. They have no hope. Great blessing from God. Now then, we need to be ready to answer about that hope. To give an answer to any man that asks us, ask us about that hope. We need to be ready with an answer. Prepared. Well, that's preparing ourselves, our hearts, to teach others. The great commission that Jesus gives to his apostles and to us today, go into all the world, make disciples of every nation. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Go teach repentance and remission of sins among all nations. There's preparing our hearts to go and fulfill that great commission. And so we need to be prepared to teach others. And then the why. We're going to make it stand for yield not to temptation. We have a song that was written by Horatio R. Palmer. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He'll carry you through. Shun evil companions, he says. Bad language, disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. To him that are cometh, God giveth the crown. Through faith we will conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. And then the refrain, ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. But yield not to temptation. We are to fight off temptation. James, the fourth chapter, verse 7 and verse 8. James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, or cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Submit to God, draw nigh to God. But in doing that, you must, and in order to do that, you must resist the devil. Yield not to the temptations that Satan places in our way. Realizing 
that God's always going to provide a way of escape. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, in verse 13, that there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God is not going to allow Satan to tempt us in such a way that we cannot overcome the temptation. We, though, must not yield to it. Jesus had spent 40 days and 40 nights without food. Satan comes to him and says, basically, aren't you hungry? Wouldn't a little food taste well? Wouldn't it satisfy your cravings? See those rocks over there? Make them into stones. And Jesus' response was, well, I need some food. It tastes good. It satisfied my hunger. No, it was, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He did not yield to the temptation that was there. God had made a way of escape, and it was through recognizing what God had said, the Word of God. And as we properly use that Word, we can escape the temptations that Satan places within our way. And so, yield not to temptation. Look for that way that God has provided to escape and flee that temptation so that we sin not. Yes, we are to, should have a happy new year. But the only way we can do so is if we do these very simple things. If we will hold fast our faith. If we will assemble with the saints. If we will pray earnestly. If we will prepare our hearts and yield not to temptation. Then we can have a happy, a successful new year. But if you're not a Christian, why not humbly submit yourself to the will of God? He is there with all of these blessings that he will bestow upon you if you will submit to his will. If you become a Christian but haven't lived the type of life that God wants you to live, then why not come back into him this morning? Repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them so that you can once again enjoy those blessings that God will give unto you. So that you can, yes, enjoy those blessings, but also be that faithful child of God with the hope of an eternity of, in heaven awaiting you when Christ comes again. If you need to come, and why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation song? Oh.